Thank you very much. Stay with us, though, because we're going to bring in Sir Gerald Howarth, the former Defence Minister who worked in government alongside Theresa May, and joins us now. Good morning to you, uh, Gerald. What's your reaction to that announcement from Mrs May this morning? Well, I'm not entirely surprised. I think that uh, she's done a service in staying on after she ceased to be Prime Minister. Other Prime Ministers have just left immediately after uh, having left uh, Number 10 Downing Street. And I agree with James Price. I think she was a very decent lady. I mean, I am on the right of the party. I, I'm a, 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 an unashamed right-wing Tory, so I'm not a member of the One Nation group, nor have I ever been. Um, but we're a broad church, and I think that uh, some things that James has said about uh, Theresa May, who believed passionately in what she was doing, and I think actually that applies to a very large number of members of Parliament. And it's a shame the public is led to believe that members of Parliament are just in it for themselves. Theresa May was not. Most members of Parliament are not either. Uh, I think, though, unfortunately, uh, she got Brexit wrong. Uh, she said to me repeatedly that uh, that no deal was better than a bad deal. Uh, but unfortunately, under the influence of uh, Ollie Robbins, she came up with a disastrous deal, and that's why she left office. And there's a little lesson for our times, if I may say, and that is in 2017, uh, she was way ahead in the opinion polls. And so all the Conservative members of Parliament, Conservative candidates standing were encouraged to have a poster saying, standing with Theresa May, my son-in-law here in, in Suffolk, uh, James Cartley, standing with Theresa May. And then, as you've just said, she just squeaked through. So um, I think there may be a lesson uh, for Sir Keir Starmer there. But let's, uh, let's not forget, we do remember her shoes. And uh, <laughs> she, was, she always had the most amazing pair of shoes on. Whenever I passed, saw her or passed her by when she was sitting on the front bench, uh, it was the shoes that stood out. And I don't think she'd be ashamed of that as a legacy either. Well, I guess not. But apart from her shoes and her dancing, which was terrible, uh, what will her legacy be, Sir Gerald? Well, I do think, actually, I think Jen said again, or Alicia said, that um, she was the, one of the longest-serving Home Secretaries in a department which uh, that uh, celebrated Labour member department, uh, great man, uh, John Reid, said was um, unfit for purpose when he became Home Secretary. Theresa May survived that uh, for six years, and she did a lot of good work on anti-terrorism. Uh, she basically had to fight the courts. Uh, she did it with uh, extraordinary uh, commitment and hard work in trying to root out terrorism, terrorism and get terrorists uh, sent out of the United Kingdom. So personally, uh, that will be her, uh, my outstanding memory of her contribution uh, to our country. I don't think Brex Brexit was her, her most glorious hour, as I've just said, but I do think that she did a great job at the Home Office. I think just surviving at the Home Office, something, but I think she did positive work as well. Uh, Joe, what about the timing of this decision? She's not going to trigger a by-election. She's going to stand down at the election. But also the fact that she's made this announcement to her local newspaper. What does that tell us about her as a person? Well, I do happen to know personally that she was very committed to her constituency because... Um, uh, it, it, it is where I came from, and my mother lived there. And uh, uh, my mother, who not always agreed with uh, um, Theresa May, uh, nevertheless uh, found her a very uh, committed local member of parliament. And I think that her announcing her decision to the uh, to the Maidenhead Advertiser, a newspaper with which I am very familiar, I thought was absolutely typical of her and the right thing to do. Uh, but I know that, uh, as I say, she was very committed to her constituency and I think she's done the right thing. And also, of course, she lived in her constituency, or correction, lives in her constituency. So I think that that is uh, all uh, a decent. But, you know, she's been there for 27 years. I was there for nearly 30 years. And uh, there does come a time when uh, you have to consider if that there are other things beyond the House of Commons. And certainly, I, after three sleepless nights thinking what on earth had I done when I decided to stand down in 2017. Uh, I haven't looked back since and I'm sure Theresa May and her husband Sir Philip uh, will also find themselves in that situation. I certainly hope so. Uh, so Gerald, can, we, can I just ask you about uh, Theresa May's response to the Grenfell fire disaster? Because at the time she was heavily criticised 
for her response to it, whilst Jeremy Corbyn was lauded for his? I think the uh, the Grenfell fire disaster was absolutely dreadful situation. Of course, a massive tragedy. It's very difficult, though, when you are in government trying to deal with a whole raft of issues to recognise uh, the breaking news story. The fact is, as ministers, we all had, uh, I imagine ministers still do have, television screens in their offices, which are more or less permanently on, because uh, unlike in the old days, uh, breaking news comes to the public via their iPhones and their tablets and so on. And as a politician, as a minister, you've got to be on top of it. You've also and... got to show empathy, haven't you, uh, Sir Gerald? And and it came across, despite us discussing her being, a, you know, a, a decent human being, that actually she couldn't respond to what was a human tragedy. Well, it was difficult to respond. Well, uh, of course, it, well, we're not all given to, uh, to to showing showing emotion, uh, and indeed, it is a like very famous British characteristic. You show a stiff upper lip. Um, that is something that has, has defined us down the centuries. Uh, so we're not like the Italians uh, or indeed the French. Uh, and I don't think it's fair to criticise her, to be perfectly honest. I think it's much more important that we criticise the people who made the decision uh, to allow that cladding to be put on in the first place. Uh, and my understanding uh, is that uh, the local authority who have responsibility for, uh, for, for building control it, the, the local authority must bear some responsibility, but there's an inquiry going on, and I don't think that it, it serves any purpose, frankly, uh, to, uh, uh, to, do, to, to dwell on that tragedy. Uh, what we need to do now is to make sure that tragedy is not repeated so those people's lives were not lost in vain, and that uh, uh, other occupants of high-rise blocks can live in peace uh, and, and comfort and security, knowing that uh, the people responsible for deciding on the safety of the building are doing their job properly. Shall we move on to um, the other big story uh, of today? And that is the front of uh, the Daily Mail. Uh, Don't leave our country defenceless, uh, the headline, uh, Sir Gerald. Britain has no credible plan to fund the armed forces. It's a damning report from the Public Accounts Committee. Uh, what's your response to it? Well, it is a, a very timely and very useful report, I have to say, but um, two things. One, the report says uh, that there's nothing new in the, uh, what we might call, uh, in, in normal parlance, the cock-ups in, uh, in the procurement of defence equipment. I've been reading such reports from the PAC, the Public Accounts Committee, and from the National Audit Office for the past 20 years, and I'm afraid there is a very familiar tone uh, about this. Uh, however, um, the report, I think, has been overtaken by events. Uh, it happens that the current Minister for Defence Procurement is my son-in-law, and last week in the House of Commons, he introduced his uh, new paper, uh, which I have in front of me, uh, which is the uh, integrated, uh, if I can tell you, the integrated procurement model. Uh, I, I commend the reading of it to uh, to all those who are interested in defence. Or, and, or insomniacs, uh, I think... perhaps. <laughs> no offence to your again. son-in-law. Or insomniacs. Well, no offence no, to I, your I, son-in-law. I, I, no, no. Uh, yeah, I, 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 indeed, I, I, I am very conscious that this is a, quite a technical area and I'm not seeking to bore your viewers and listeners. <laughs> um, but those who are interested in defence, I do commend it to them. because It's actually uh, quite a short document and quite simple. But the key thing about it is we have moved on from the Cold War. I mean, my generation dominated by the Cold War and defence procurement was basically um, really seeing the, meeting the Russians, getting ahead of them, and each side matching the other. Today, we're in a war in Europe. And what um, the, uh, the, the current government has recognised is that we need a whole new procurement model. So this uh, statement, which the, uh, the minister made last week, which is widely welcomed in the House, uh, recognises that uh, we have got to, to, to set up some new principles, and it's encapsulated in this integrated design authority, which will determine military priorities. Uh, and uh, it will have rapid procurement at the heart of it, what's called spiral development. So let me give you an example. I was in charge of the Type 26 Global Combat Ship, which is the uh, new generation of frigate. 
uh, I shook hands with the, uh, the business uh, development director of BA Systems responsible for the design. I said, why don't we uh, 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 fix the prize of 250 million uh, pounds? We shook hands because I knew the Royal Navy the next day would say, oh, we need to tweak this. We need to tweak that. We need to put more. That ship is now going to cost 1.3 billion mm. pounds. Absolutely ridiculous. So what you've got to do, you've got to freeze the design, get that uh, get that uh, capability built, and then uh, build into it what's called open architecture. So you can put new computer uh, systems as they come online. You can apply them. Uh, new defense equipment, so new weapons perhaps attached to a ship or to an aircraft. And that, that's that's called spiral development. And that's what we did in the Second World War. The first Spitfire didn't bear, bear a lot of relationship uh, uh, to a Mark IX. And so looked the same, but uh, lots of different configurations uh, internally. So uh, that is what we've got to do. And uh, we've got to freeze the design, get that kit into service, and, and then develop it in service. And we are doing that at the moment. We're committing uh, drones to Ukraine. And, and these are being built within weeks and months, designed and built and shipped to Ukraine. And then the feedback from Ukraine is being fed into new design or tweaking of the design. And that is the way uh, we have got to go. And exportability yeah, and is the other thing. A... Exportability has got to be built in because yeah. exportability means that the armed forces are not allowed to create bespoke equipment, which ends up being incredibly expensive and unaffordable. Former Defence Minister Gerald Howe, thank you very much indeed for joining us this morning. Um...